Okay, very good. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I'll briefly go over the motivation for our talk, um, then uh, uh, introduce the governing equations for direct numerical simulations of fluid mechanical flows, uh, discuss the role of dimensionless parameters and how the computational effort scales with them. Uh, that'll lead us to the need for turbulence modeling, and I'll introduce two different approaches here. And then I'll briefly touch on some other aspects of upscaling. So our interest is in performing high resolution simulations in particular of turbidity currents, um, so of sediment transport flows from the continental shelf down the continental slope into the deep ocean. Just to remind everybody, turbidity currents are gravity driven sediment flows uh, down the continental slope. Uh, they represent an important part of the global sediment cycle. They're frequently triggered by storms or earthquakes or other natural um, uh, reasons. They can also be triggered by man-made origins. Uh, they can be incredibly large. One turbidity current can transport many cubic kilometers of sediment. And just to give you an idea of their scale, they can uh, travel over distances up to the order of a thousand kilometers or more. Uh, they can have front velocities up to 10 meters a second and front heights up to 100 meters. So, if we want to perform high resolution simulations of such flows, we typically approach them as dilute flows, meaning we assume that the volume fraction of the grains, of the sediment grains, is on the order of 1% or less. Uh, we also assume that the grain radius is much less than the grain separation, so that collisions among uh, sediment grains can be neglected, and we assume that the grains are relatively small, so that they don't have any uh, considerable inertia. Now, due to the small volume fraction of the grains, we can neglect their effect in the uh, conservation of uh, mass, or in the conservation of volume equation, so in the continuity equation, Rather, the coupling between the fluid motion and the sediment motion occurs primarily through the momentum equation. So the sediment essentially varies the density, the local density field of the uh, suspension, and then gravity acts on those density variations in order to uh, trigger the flow. Uh, the sediment is also then uh, assumed to follow the fluid motion uh, and have a superimposed settling velocity. So these are then our governing equations. We have the fluid continuity equation, so conservation of mass. Here we have the conservation of momentum, where C is the uh, sediment concentration, and so we see this is uh, the effective density uh, term here, and gravity then acts on those density variations in order to drive the flow. And the sediment is uh, being tracked uh, by means of uh, 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 convection diffusion equation, where we assume that the sediment moves with the fluid velocity, plus it has a superimposed settling velocity. So in making these equations dimensionless, we obtain three uh, dimensionless parameters. There's the Reynolds number, which is the combination of a characteristic velocity, such as the front velocity of the current, a characteristic length scale, such as the height of the current, and the kinematic viscosity of water. There's also the Schmidt number, which is the ratio of the diffusion coefficients in these two equations, and the dimensionless settling velocity. Now, the most important parameter here is the Reynolds number, and let's just uh, see what kind of order of magnitude we have for the Reynolds number when we're looking at real field scale currents. So, as I mentioned, they can have a front velocity on the order of 10 meters a second. They can be up to 100 meters uh, tall, and this is the kinematic viscosity of water. So that gives us a field uh, uh, a Reynolds number up to 10 to the ninth. Please keep that in mind. So <coughs> Reynolds numbers in the field can be up to 10 to the ninth. Now, if we want to do DNS simulations, so direct numerical simulations, we take a model configuration, which we call the log exchange configuration. So this is essentially uh, <coughs> an apparatus that you initially divide into two compartments. So we have here one compartment into which we fill initially water and we stir sand into it. And then we have here clear water initially. And then we have here a little Gaussian bump just to introduce an element of complex bottom topography. At time t equals zero, we then remove the dividing wall between these two compartments. 
And now this combination of water and uh, sediment is uh, denser than the clear water here, so it slumps to the bottom and forms a current that propagates along the bottom of the container. So we have here the turbidity current propagating, and then the clear water has to get out of the way and forms a counterflowing current along the top of the container. So just uh, for those people who are interested, a few uh, facts on the numerical method uh, that uh, Mohammed uh, developed in order to do DNS simulations of such flows. Uh, we're using second order central differencing for the viscous terms, uh, so-called ENO schemes for the convective terms, uh, TVD Runge-Kutta time stepping, so explicit time stepping. Uh, we use a projection method to enforce encron passability. The uh, domain decomposition approach uh, in order to parallelize our code, and we heavily rely on the Petsy uh, software package that was developed at Argon in order to solve our systems of uh, algebraic equations. We can also use non-uniform grids in order to resolve the regions near the bottom of the uh, uh, flow uh, uh, more finely. Uh, because that's where more of the action occurs. And we have a very nice immerse boundary method that allows us to uh, deal with uh, complex bottom topographies in a very uh, accurate uh, way. So this is a DNS simulation, a movie of a DNS simulation that I want to show you um, that Mohammed made. So up here we will see the flow. In the plane below, we plot uh, values of the shear stress, and in the lowest plane, you see information on the deposit height. So here the current is developing. We see initially the development of so-called lobe and cleft instabilities. Then the current interacts with this uh, three-dimensional bottom topography. It becomes fully turbulent. It's uh, uh, strongly three-dimensional. We see how these flow structures have a strong influence of the local uh, shear stress behavior. Uh, uh, which, uh, of course, then has an effect on the erosional behavior. Maybe I can show this movie once again. And uh, we can also see how the deposit uh, height locally is uh, very much affected by this uh, topographical uh, feature here. So, yeah, just to see that movie once again. So initially it's nearly two-dimensional. It develops some frontal instability and then becomes strongly three-dimensional when it interacts with this Gaussian bump. And you can see here uh, how that affects the local uh, deposit height and how it affects the local shear stress uh, along the bottom wall. So this is a DNS simulation, as I mentioned. Uh, it um, was carried out not for Reynolds number of 10 to the 9, uh, uh, so for the Reynolds number corresponding to a real field scale current, but for a smaller Reynolds number of 2,000. Now if we think about what that means, that corresponds more to a front velocity of 2 centimeters a second to a length scale perhaps of 10 centimeters, and here again the kinematic viscosity of water. So this very much corresponds to a laboratory scale current, not to a field scale current. So we can do the DNS simulation for the laboratory scale, but not for the field scale, and that's of course uh, something that we would like to overcome because eventually we would like to make uh, simulations for field scale currents. Here's another simulation, another DNS simulation. This is one of a turbidity current that propagates down a submarine channel, and there are, some, uh, there are levees on both sides of the channel as well, and um, uh, people have speculated that when a turbidity current like this encounters a bend in the submarine channel, then uh, it might partially overflow, which is called uh, flow stripping. And so we wanted to see if we see that in the numerical simulations as well. So here's our turbidity current propagating down the uh, uh, submarine channel. And indeed, there's this flow stripping occurring in the bends of the submarine channel. Uh, so uh, we see that uh, these things are being reproduced in quite some detail. So. To summarize, uh, for DNS simulations, we see they have uh, quite a few advantages. They accurately reproduce the physics because we resolve all of the scales. Uh, they provide very detailed information on the flow field, on shear stresses, on deposit profiles, and so on. And they require only a minimum of empirical modeling assumptions. The disadvantages are that they are computationally very expensive 
and uh, they are limited to low Reynolds numbers. So the question then is why can we not do, why can we not do a DNS simulation at Reynolds number 10 to the 9? So why can we not simply say we want to resolve all the scales for such a high Reynolds number flow? Well, in order to understand that, it uh, helps to think of the Reynolds number uh, as effectively a measure of the of the ratio of the largest length scales in the flow to the smallest length scales in the flow. So the largest length scales in the flow, the so-called integral length scales, those might be something like the front height of the current, whereas the smallest uh, length scales of the flow, the so-called Kolmogorov length scales, those are the very tiny vortices that we have in the flow where viscosity is strong enough in order to uh, convert uh, kinetic energy into heat. So that's where dissipation occurs. And turbulence theory, theory shows us that this ratio of the largest length scales to the smallest length scales scales with a, a Reynolds number to the, three, uh, to the 3 fourth. So DNS simulations, which uh, of course need to resolve these smallest length scales and at the same time have a controlled domain that's large enough to capture the, the uh, largest uh, length scales, they then require this kind of scaling, Reynolds number to the 3 fourth in all three directions. So that means they require Reynolds number to the 9 fourth grid points. In addition, the time step also has to scale with the grid spacing. So that tells us that in the end, the computational effort is on the order of Reynolds number to the third power. So when you compare now that we did our DNS simulation for a Reynolds number of about 10 to the 3, but the field scale current was uh, for Reynolds number of 10 to the 9th, then we see that uh, the field scale simulation would require on the order of 10 to the 18 times uh, the effort of the laboratory scale current. And the laboratory scale current, of course, uh, already took several days on maybe about 100 processors. So even with Janus, I'm sorry to say, we're not going to overcome this factor of 10 to the 18 anytime soon. So, the question then is how can we perform simulations at the field scale? <clears throat> so here the key idea is that, <clears throat> that um, the large scale flow features are unique for every flow, but perhaps we can assume that the very smallest length scales of the flow, the ones at which uh, dissipation occurs, may be somewhat universal. So in other words, the the smallest uh, length scale, the smallest vortices of turbulent flow fields may be very uh, universal in nature and very similar in all kinds of flows. And so as a result, it might be able to develop a turbulence model that allows us to model the effect of these smallest length scales without having actually to uh, resolve them explicitly. And, and the most important effect of these smallest length scales that we need to capture is the energy that they extract from the larger scale. So we need to make sure that in our simulation uh, we do capture this effect of the small length scales to extract energy from the large length scales and if we do not explicitly resolve the small length scales then we need to have a model, a turbulence model that uh, extracts the energy for us. And so there are essentially two established approaches uh, in order to accomplish this. One is based on the temporal averaging of the governing equations, uh, and that's the so-called Reynolds average Navier-Stokes approach or RANS approach. The other approach is based on spatial averaging of the governing equations or spatial filtering, and that leads us to large eddy simulations. So let me just uh, give you the key ideas of uh, how these approaches work. So first on RANS simulations, so here we want to do a temporal averaging. So we take all of the variables of the flow field, such as velocity, pressure, sediment concentration, and so on, split them into one time averaged value and into one uh, fluctuating value. And then we take our governing equations that I had written down earlier. We take the time average of all the terms in the governing equations in order to derive a set of equations for these time average quantities here. And then the hope is that if we uh, can solve only for the time average uh, values, then we don't have to uh, have as fine a grid. But the problem that appears is that we have nonlinear terms in our equations, both 
in the sediment transport equation and also in the momentum equation. And these nonlinear terms, when you take the time average of them, of these products of the time average value and the fluctuating value, then you get this. And this term here, the time average of the product of the two fluctuations, that is not equal to zero and it's not negligible. And so this is a term that we cannot get directly out of calculating just the time average values of the individual uh, quantities. So this term here uh, is uh, essentially the crux of the problem because it doesn't disappear and because it means we cannot entirely neglect the fluctuating quantities. Uh, and so we have a closure problem because we have more unknowns now than we have uh, equations. So in some sense then, this is the term that we need to model when we uh, perform turbulence modeling. And so many such uh, models have been developed to capture the effects of these uh, terms. And you may have heard of a few of them, mixing length models, k-epsilon models, Reynolds stress models, and so on. Uh, all of these problems, uh, they, they are of course uh, at various degrees of sophistication, but all of these problems, all of these models involve several empirical constants, and these constants again depend on the flow physics, on the flow geometry, on all kinds of things, and so it's very difficult to determine reliable values for these empirical constants, especially when we're looking at flows uh, involving complex physics such as sediment transport, erosion, deposition, and so on, uh, over complex topography, so in complex uh, uh, geometries. And so that means as a result, there's a large amount of uncertainty associated with these empirical constants, and so there's a large amount of uncertainty associated with the results of uh, RAND simulations. So RAND simulations do offer some promise, but at the same time they have uh, these drawbacks. Um, well, there's this alternative approach of large eddy simulations. And so remember, for RAND simulations, we used a time averaging approach. For large eddy simulation, we essentially use a spatially averaging approach or a spatial filtering approach. So we take uh, our original velocity field and uh, we then do this filtering process here, and there's a spatial length scale associated with the filter, and so in that way we get a filtered velocity which now contains only the large scales and not the small scales. And so again the hope is that we can derive a set of equations just for these large scale quantities, and so in that way we may not have to remove, uh, resolve the small scale quantities. But just like for the Rand's approach, uh, we find that again here we do get a closure uh, problem uh, because we cannot entirely neglect the effect of these unresolved quantities and so again we need empirical models in order to uh, capture the so-called subgrid scale effect so uh, uh, the, the, the effect of stresses and transport that occurs at uh, smaller scales than our uh, grid resolution uh, tells us. So we need uh, then LES turbulence models, and again, a variety of models have been developed. Uh, the most uh, uh, well-known one, perhaps, is the Smagorinsky model. Uh, but again, these models involve empirical constants. Now, people have actually developed very sophisticated procedures, so-called dynamic models, that automatically determine these constants within the course of a simulation. So you do not have to prescribe these models all uh, before this, uh, these uh, constants before the simulation, and then they stay constant, but uh, through a double filtering procedure, actually, these constants can be determined automatically during the simulation. So that has brought some progress. And as a result, LES generally can be considered to be more accurate than RANS, uh, but it's also more expensive computationally as an approach. So we can say that there's uh, still some uncertainty associated even with LES modeling, and so clearly there's more research uh, needed on this uh, whole um, uh, issue of turbulence modeling. But let me just show you a couple of uh, uh, results. Uh, so these are simulations, LES simulations that uh, Sentiel, who's in the back of the room, a postdoc in my group, has performed. 
Uh, so here we see the low Reynolds number simulation that uh, uh, Mohammed did for a Reynolds number of 1,000, and then by comparison, an LES simulation of the same flow uh, for a Reynolds number of 200,000. And you can see that the turbidity current in the LES simulation has moved uh, much farther uh, at the same time, uh, so it has a larger front velocity, uh, and also it shows much more small-scale structure than the DNS simulation, and that's exactly what we would expect for a large Reynolds number, uh, that we see a lot more uh, small-scale deformations of uh, uh, these uh, concentration contours and small-scale vortices and so on. <coughs> This is at a later time, and again, we see the same difference. The uh, high Reynolds number current has moved uh, faster, and it exhibits uh, a much more small-scale structure. So we see there's certainly some promise in these uh, LES simulations in order to help us to get closer to these uh, field-scale uh, Reynolds numbers, um, and we're currently working on uh, uh, further refining these LES models so that indeed we can go to Reynolds numbers uh, up to 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8, and 10 to the 9th. Um, so this uh, turbulence modeling is one aspect of uh, upscaling results, so uh, going from laboratory-scale currents to uh, large-scale currents. Uh, there are a couple of other aspects of upscaling when we think of upscaling again as going from very small scale phenomena to large scale phenomena and I want to mention those as well. So this is uh, the work of uh, Zach Borden who uh, had the very nice uh, experience of uh, uh, winning the poster award last night. Um, and so uh, we can look at his work also as one aspect of upscaling uh, in that what he does is he wants to uh, try to use particle-based simulations, so simulations that resolve each grain uh, of the sediment in order to gain a better understanding of uh, erosion and the balance between erosion and deposition so that from these very detailed small-scale simulations we can then get uh, better correlations between, for example, uh, wall shear stresses and effective erosion rates, right? So the idea here is to carry out uh, very small-scale simulations that only resolve a few hundred or a few thousand sediment grains uh, in order to uh, obtain relationships which we can then use in much larger continuum-based uh, uh, simulations. So let me just show you this little movie that uh, Zach made. Uh, so here we have a flow uh, propagating over a sediment bed and uh, you see as soon as the flow starts, it starts to erode sediment grains. Uh, at the same time, gravity wants to bring those sediment grains back down. Uh, and uh, so we have this balance of uh, erosion and deposition. And so we hope that these uh, kinds of simulations will tell us more about this uh, very important region where the turbidity current uh, uh, touches the sediment bed and um, uh, allow us to develop better models for erosion and uh, deposition. Uh, so if we uh, then uh, uh, can derive such continuum models, then we can do simulations such as these, where now erosion is just um, a function of the bottom wall shear stress. And these are two simulations. One is for a slope angle of three degrees, and you see here, erosion is weaker than deposition, so here the flow dies, whereas if we go to four degrees, then erosion has become stronger than deposition, and so in this case, the amount of uh, uh, suspended sediment grows, and we have an avalanche-like effect. The current accelerates and uh, grows in, uh, uh, in magnitude. We can then take those kinds of calculations in order to uh, try to get uh, some first uh, stratigraphic information. So this shows a picture of um, uh, um, yeah, a, a series of simulations, the deposit profiles that come out of a series of simulations. Uh, I think here we had uh, about 40 different simulations. They were polydispersed. So in each simulation, we had both uh, small particles, uh, which are given here by the blue color, 
and large particles, large grains, which are given by the red color. And these uh, currents all came from the left and then deposited uh, their particles. And we see initially, of course, more of the large red grains are being deposited. Uh, the small blue grains are deposited further downstream. Uh, but then we also see these interesting uh, uh, striations here. So we see, um, uh, uh, for example, how the first current, yep, how the first current uh, first deposited uh, the very large red particles, then the somewhat smaller yellow particles on top. Then comes the next current uh, depositing uh, first the red particles, then the yellow particles. And so we do get uh, some uh, uh, idea of what kind of uh, deposit profile we may form here. Uh, one other way in which we can look at uh, upscaling is uh, just sketched out here. So we can again bridge the, uh, uh, the difference between small scales and large scales by saying, okay, let's use a, a coarse uh, mesh for a very large domain, but then let's zoom into a small region here and uh, let's uh, zoom further in so that we have uh, a, a very small region here now which we can resolve with a much finer mesh. So this is again another way in which uh, scales can be bridged and um, uh, this is what is called a nested grid approach. So we have a fine uh, grid here and a much coarser grid here and actually we're just starting a project uh, that employs this kind of technique sponsored by uh, BOEM in the Gulf of Mexico where we're trying to couple uh, a, a coarse grain ROMS model to a fine grained uh, turbidity current model in order to study the interaction between the large scales and the small scales uh, in these uh, Gulf of Mexico um, uh, events. So let me just summarize. Um, so if we do DNS simulations, they have great advantages. They give us all kinds of detailed information, very accurate, but their computational effort increases with the third power of the Reynolds number. And so as a result, for realistic uh, field scale currents, we cannot really perform DNS. Uh, so that means there is a need to uh, do some turbulence modeling, uh, and we can do either RAND simulations or LES simulations. However, both of these approaches uh, require some empirical constants, some empirical closure models, and so as a result there are some uncertainties associated with them. Uh, and then I briefly touched upon some other aspects of upscaling, of bridging uh, the divide between small scales and large scales, such as going from microscopic particle-based models to large-scale continuum models or using uh, nested grids. Okay, thank you very much. Again, everything crystal clear. Huh? Yes. Oh, Just okay. uh, uh, one question is, uh, how, do, how do the particles affect the turbulence in your model? Excuse me, how? How do the presence of the particles yes. affect the turbulence? Oh, the, the, in, you mean in the continuum flow simulations? In the large eddy simulation. You should in the large eddy simulation. In the high concentrations. Well, the, uh, the turbulence uh, is essentially generated um, because the flow is driven by density differences and so the particles determine the local density of the suspension and so if we have high concentrations of particles in some regions, low concentration in other regions, then gravity will pull this region down much more strongly than this region and so that sets the fluid in motion and that generates the turbulence. But when you look at the erosion processes near the bed, yes. It's uh, probably affected by the presence of particles, the, the turbulence, oh, yes. turbulence stress and so on. Yes, that's, that's right. And that's exactly why we're doing these microscopic particle-based simulations, uh, because we want to see how exactly the turbulence and the particles interact. Um, and there, clearly, we have particle interactions, um, so collisions among particles. And um, so there, the situation becomes much more complicated. That's why we're doing these very refined small-scale simulations. Okay, so you have interactions in the model. Yes, Particle yes. The particles interact with the fluid and among each other, and so the turbulence can be damped uh, by the particles, uh, uh, which is something that uh, people have also observed in laboratory experiments. So we expect that we will capture all those effects, yes. Yeah. 
Very interesting. Good. Yeah, one of your last slides you mentioned Gulf of Mexico, I think, but I think you showed Monterey Canyon. That's Obviously, right. They That's right. To yes. Be related, but I was wondering where in the Gulf of Mexico is this study intended to be? Is it a particular site? Yes, James, do you Canyon want to comment on that? Or uh, over or why we picked a certain site? Yes. 